Um, Ryan Hurd um, has been involved with in the world of dreams for quite a long time. He has a website which he'll tell you about. I don't remember what the URL is. And um, what's fascinating for me anyway is that Ryan is actually a researcher into dreams. Uh, he's got a lot of different collaborative activities, everything from um, kind of group dreaming to a, uh, the effect of um, the substance which is legal called um, galantamine on um, enhancing lucid dreams. He's written several books. His most recent book um, is, will be in the second edition. It's coming out soon. And um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Ryan. And um, it's about nightmares, the phenomenon of nightmares. Um, and Ryan has shared with me on a podcast and also in conversation that to some extent that's what's got him started. As a young boy, um, he went to see, uh, he, he was in, he was getting, he was a babysitter, had a babysitter that allowed him to see Poltergeist. Some of you are old enough to remember this movie. It wasn't, <laughs> and it, it was scary. <laughs> and still is. <laughs> and still is. <laughs> yeah, and so Ryan, Ryan got to, um, you know, um, and that was really the early impetus. And he's also, he also, his first academic career actually was as, as an archeologist. And as an archaeologist, he uh, participated in, a, I'll call it, informal um, dream archaeology, where he'd go to a site and sleep in the site and see, see what dreams emerge. The guy wow. knows so much about dreams, it, it's like, it's just so wonderful to talk to him. Uh, Ryan, the floor is yours. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, it's really good to be here. Uh, and. We have a nice, <clears throat> this is a perfect size workshop for being a little more flexible. So yeah, you can put questions into chat. Um, and then we'll have a number of interactive elements to, to today's workshop where we can share dreams as well as ask questions. And I did, um, I did make up a pretty um, structured agenda, which Angela has been making fun of me for for a while. but. But it's it's flexible, and we'll just go. We can totally go where the conversation takes us as well. Um, so so that's absolutely that's absolutely fine. Uh, so uh, and Angela, thanks. Just I mean, you've already set the space so well uh, in terms of um, grounding us, um, some sacred words. Uh, this is something I really appreciate. It's part of my own practice. Uh, and so I also have some some opening words to kind of to, to draw us in, especially to this time of pandemic dreaming. Uh, and they're the words of Frederick Nietzsche. And so in the uh, in the birth of the tragedy, he went on and on about dreams for quite some time. And this particular quote has always galvanized me, especially in times of crisis. Uh, which is where I think dreams are at their best. And he says, perhaps many will, like myself, recall amid the dangers and terrors of dreams, they've occasionally said to themselves in self-encouragement and not without success, it is a dream and I will dream on. And so with that, I'm going to light a Oh, there's no batteries in my fake candle, so we will pretend that my fake candle is lit. But we have entered a sacred space. <laughs> so yeah, so 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 uh, we came up with this idea uh, about dreaming in the time of pandemic because so many of us are experiencing dreams right now, um, heightened dreams, vivid dreams, and and it's it's just. I think culturally, collectively, as a world, this is turning out to be a very explosive time for dreams. Uh, and there's already some research that's backing this up. And I mentioned in the first call, but it bears repeating that, that there was a research group called the Lions Neuroscience Research Center that found that dream recall has already increased by 35% since Basically, since um, mid-March, um, people are reporting, so they're reporting more dreams and more vivid dreams. Um, and along with that, more anxiety dreams, more nightmares, as well as just more um, impactful dreams in general that aren't necessarily negative, but are that, that you know, we wake up and we're left with um, 
we're left with those feelings. So, um, you know, some other evidence about the, just what a moment this is for dreaming, and it really is. Like, there, I don't think I've seen as many pieces in the press about dreaming. Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe since the early 90s, I think maybe the, I mean, I think it's been 25 years really since it's been like this, you know, when Inception came out in 2000, when was that? 2006, 2010, I can't recall. That was sort of a spike in lucid dreaming, you know, becoming conscious in the dream world. But this is interesting because it's not just about lucidity. It's about what are these weird, vivid, bizarre dreams. And on Twitter, you know, there's been trending topics such as pandemic nightmares, COVID-19 dreams, pandemic dreaming. You know, so these have been trending topics um, more so in April and May. And I think that things have settled down a bit since then. Um, I think the first wave of dreaming is uh, we're on the downslide. And so I'm kind of interested to see what the next, what the next spike will be. Um, so, so bottom line is this is just a, this is a really good opportunity for dreamers to, to explore dreams because there's so many of us who have this happening. And so we can kind of basically become part of this collective, collective movement. And so with that, I just wanted to sort of open it up a little bit to a show of hands. Um, you know, raise your hand if you have yourself been experiencing more dream recall uh, since say mid-March or so. So a couple of us has, uh, how many of y'all, raise your hand if you can recall say one or two dreams a month. Okay, so most people in the room. Um, how about one dream a week? Okay, so most of y'all. And how about uh, one dream more or less every night? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, so that's great. So we've got some, we've got some dreaming. And, and the thing is, is don't feel, um, I'm certainly not meaning to shame someone who doesn't recall a lot of dreams. Uh, that's not what this is about. And dream recall is something that can be enhanced um, simply by paying attention to it, by focusing um, and doing a couple of core practices that we'll go over. Uh, and, and a couple more questions I wanted to ask is, uh, who has dreamt here about some kind of like COVID-19 related topics such as being in a dream and being anxious that someone's not social distancing or you can't find your mask or something of that nature. So yeah, okay. So Suzanne has. Um, Suzanne, would you feel comfortable in sharing your dream? And you can pass if... if, if um, no, no. Um, <clears throat> It, it sort of, it, it wasn't really a personal dream, you know, like I make a lot of art. So in the dream, sort of a painting appears, which is a COVID painting of this big COVID virus kind of coming down into a kingdom and people kind of um, looking at it in wonder and all different kinds of personages doing different kinds of things with it. So it seemed like it was not that personal but maybe a little more archetypal in a sense wow yeah that's 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 fairly dramatic yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely how about has anyone had any dreams about insects or bugs or infestations of rats it, it, since pandemic began is that tracy um yeah, actually, the dream about the insects was about bees, and I have a really good relationship with bees. Um, so for me, the bees were like the answer to the problem, if you will, and it actually inspired a piece of art. So um, that's kind of how that was practiced. Nice. Thanks. Thanks for that. Wow. So um, I'm really um, hearing this, the themes of um, artistic imagery coming out of dreams already. That's, that's wonderful. So one of the things that's come out of some of the dream research that um, there's a couple of dream researchers that have done some sort of early preliminary work looking at the themes of dreams from since the pandemic. Um, there's a lot of these anxious themes about masks and did I catch the virus and this person's standing too close to me or I'm going for a hug and then I realize it's not safe. So these sort of like 
surface level, I would say parallel waking life themes. But then there's been a lot of people who've had been dreaming about bugs, bugs and insects and rats, um, which is clearly, you know, a, a metaphor for um, our time, for, um, you know, our unseen, you know, we are in a time of an unseen threat. And so the dreams are sort of making a, making an image about that. Um, there's also been increased apocalyptic dreams, you know, world ending scenarios, zombie dreams, uh, which again is, a, I think, a pretty clear metaphor for sickness. Um, zombies themselves, you know, being, uh, you know, vectors, being uh, carrying vectors. Uh, and then there's this other theme that Kelly Bulkley has brought out in some of his work. Um, and his, he has a blog on psychology today that I would really recommend. Uh, I think it's Dreaming in the Digital Age is the name of his channel on, on that um, site. Uh, he's been talking about how artists and people who are already sort of, you know, practiced dreamers, good dream recall, are also having these hopeful themes. And not only that, but people are beginning to dream about, you know, new beginnings. Um, people are beginning to dream about uh, even possible cures or ways of making themselves toward a new life. Um, changing changing the, um, the way that they live uh, on a personal and also like a social level. And Deirdre Barrett, uh, the Harvard professor who just wrote a book about pandemic dreaming, um, which I'd love to hawk because her work is always, always fun. This is a very slim little volume. I think it's 86 pages or something. But she busted it out really quickly to capture this moment. And it's mostly just um, contains you know, um, the themes of these dreams. Um, but she has several, writes about several people writing about possible cures uh, possible ways of, um, you know, healing, um, medicine to try, um, ways to move in the head. So, so underneath all these, you know, these nightmares, these times of anxiety, um, there's also this chance for hope, for renewal, for trying something new, for entering into a new way of being. And I think that that is, in my mind, dreaming's greatest potential is that it doesn't just show us what we already know, but offers us possibilities and, uh, and hope. So um, there's a couple of factors too I wanted to talk about in terms of why, why we're having intense dreams. Um, and I've already of course mentioned the main one, which is just that it's just the time of anxiety. And when we're anxious, we tend to dream a lot. Um, when we're um, going through emotional duress, we tend to have more dreams. That's um, but there's a couple of other factors that have made this such such the moment that it is, and um, they're maybe not what you what you would expect. And the second one that that I would say is pr probable is is that alcohol consumption has increased, um, uh, almost doubled um, in the uh, in the last few months. Um, you know, and I've, I've pulled some figures off of a couple of different state websites saying that alcohol purchases are like something like 60% higher than they were the year before at this time. And some people, I think, were doing some hoarding of alcohol at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, but what is kind of long-term trends is that actually people are drinking more. And one of the things, of course, that alcohol does is that it disrupts sleep. Uh, it disrupts REM sleep, which is where these vivid dreams often occur. And then um, it can cause this dream rebound effect. Uh, and so when people get over the dream depressing effects of alcohol, the dreams come back. And then when they do come back, they tend to be vivid and emotional um, and even more nightmarish. And so I think that um, as a culture, what we're seeing is some alcohol induced pandemic dreaming as well. Um, and then the third one is kind of the most interesting for me to think about is, is that simply that, you know, um, early morning world, you know, banker mornings, getting up with an alarm has been canceled large for large swaths of the population, right? We are not, um, we are sleeping in. We are not necessarily all of us waking up to an alarm. Now I have young kids 
I have a, I have a three year old and an eight year old, so I'm still getting up fairly early in the morning, uh, regardless. Um, but I know there's lots of people who are sleeping in, and when we sleep in, we have more dreams. And you know, in general, I think it's fair to say that uh, American culture, Eurocentric culture, Western culture, is sleep deprived. Um, you know, we don't value sleep as a, as a society. Um, and so we're getting more rest than we have been. And, and, and it's interesting because, you know, if we get, say, six hours of sleep versus eight, um, you're, not, you're not losing a quarter of your dreams. You're actually losing about half of your dream life. Wow. And the reason is, is because most of our remembered dreams are occurring in the second half of the night and especially towards the early morning when REM sleep predominates. And so in normal world before pandemic, when we're getting up at six in the morning and we're going to bed at midnight, you know, after watching Netflix, what happens is, is that we're cutting off that whole, this huge chunk of REM sleep and lots and lots of people are now getting that back. And with that is coming this explosion of dreams, this explosion of recall. So that's, I think, really instructive about, um, you know, what it takes to become a dreaming culture is number one, you have to be rested. Um, and so I think that's one of the bright spots too um, of this time with so much grief and anguish and uncertainty for the future is at least a lot of us are sleeping in um, and having time to reflect on our dreams. And so, and so, yeah, so I, that's my introduction to pandemic dreaming into, into this. And I wanna just briefly open it up. Does anyone have something that they'd like to comment uh, or say, um, or have a question perhaps uh, that's coming up for you right now before we go on? Uh, I was thinking about the theme of insects um, that are coming up in dreams. And um, <clears throat> to me, they've always been the symbol of sort of contamination. You know, something that has then become um, foul or, you know, and I think that when that happens, you know, themes of rebirth kind of go along with that to some degree. You know, it seems to be the way things cycle. Nice. Yeah, there's that theme of alchemy coming in uh, and reminding me too about Tracy's dream of the bees as being a positive sign. Um, her dream of bees was not an infestation, but was a was a healing dream of the insect we want to come back, <laughs> the right. insect that, uh, that, that we wish to come back. It's a cooperative insect, too, <laughs> which right. is not the way we are in, in the world right now. Yeah, yeah. I have a, a question about remembering dreams, which is I, I often remember a dream when I'm kind of in a halfway state, but then I don't remember it when I'm out. And I, I don't even necessarily remember the whole dream, but like the tail leg of it, I could capture. And I almost, I feel like if I put a tablet by my bed, I could write it down, but then I'd be constantly waking myself up because I'm doing skipping stone sleep and I'm catching these little tails of dreams. Um, but I don't know how, the reason I haven't written them down is I don't want to wake myself up to write it down. Mm -hmm. I hear, so, yeah, there's a tension there. Sure. Yeah, dreams are so ephemeral, right? We lose, um, we lose most of them as we shift into, into waking life. And, um, and of course, we, and we have cognitive habits that reinforce the forgetting of dreams um, because we don't live in a dreaming culture. And so when we do wake up, especially by alarm, but in general, even without the alarm, we tend to just shift into what am I doing today? What's my responsibilities? We check the news. Um, we check our email. Sometimes, and now with smartphones, it's, we do this in bed, right? We just sort of pick up the phone. I do this. I'm totally guilty of this. Not a shame thing at all. Um, it's just part of, the, it's part of the information world that we live in. And so to, we have to create a space. We have to create a space to recall dreams um, and... Um, and writing down can be helpful. Um, and maybe one of the things, Cindy, is, is simply to not pressure oneself to having to write down an entire dream, but perhaps a couple of words. The, the 
say the core emotional content or feeling or a core image, the most vivid image of the dream itself. And if you can remember one or both of those things together, there's a pretty good chance that you'll be able to recall it later on, um, as opposed to just sleepily trying to sleep right in the dark um, and then <laughs> having to try to read that later um, and failing. And so, and then, and then later to try to flesh that out. Um, and so, so yeah, so thanks for that. Um, I'm looking at the chat here. Yeah, I have a, I have a question, um, Ryan. Go ahead. Um, um, so I don't particularly like to wake, uh, wake and write dreams down. I prefer to record them. Um, what is your thoughts about that? About that? That's number one. And I'm also curious about time in dreaming. In other words, like sometimes it seems like, you know, the dream lasts for a long time, but it, it may just be a couple of moments. Um, I'm just curious about, about that. Yeah, okay. So, so and Angelo, when you say recording, you mean voice recording? I mean, recording? just, yeah, voice recording. Oh, I think it's great. No, I think that's great. Uh, whatever works, essentially. Um, so, you know, um, there used, there's not a particular dream app that I would recommend right now. There kind of were previous years and they've, they've gone, they've gone away. Uh, we're in a lull. I think that we're about to see more new dream apps come up because of the time we're in, but you don't really need a fancy app to record a dream. You can use your voice notes on a smartphone. Um, and, and the nice thing about recording a dream is that, um, you're still forced to put it to words. And so it becomes word ripe, uh, as Freud would say. Um, and, and, so it has focused dream um, and it's helpful to just notice like I would say to try to get the dream down but don't go into every single tiny detail because that can become time prohibitive um, and there's a point of diminishing returns I think as well for, for this kind of thing especially on that the time that you want but but by and large, the biggest thing to do, the most important thing to do for increasing dream recall is to do it and send, maybe have five minutes of dedicated dream recall time after you wake up in the morning. Um, and, and not writing down necessarily, but just sitting with the dream, sitting with the images, and the feelings. Um, and one thing that, that I recommend is, is when you wake up, we shift, we shift body position, it's helpful to go back into the position that you were in previously as you awoke from the dream. There's something somatic about dream recall that um, because dreaming doesn't just, it does happen in the brain, but we are still uh, living humans having a, um, you know, an existential phenomenal experience. So the body position tends to um, nonetheless play a role. So if you move back into body, the body position, it might be easier to catch the tail of the dream. I think that's a phrase that Sidney used, and it's a phrase that um, um, the dream worker Robert Moss uses when talking about, about dreaming, who's someone who uh, I would also recommend for um, if you're passionate about shamanic aspects of lucid dreams. Uh, and so in any case, um, sit there, rest there, and it's, you know, do a body scan, look for feelings, look for felt sense, look for um, pressure, tensions. And then it, sometimes when you do that, an image will just come forth. And then when that image comes forth, it's like it all like rolls out again. And then you'll be able to catch these other pieces of the narrative. So, um, so just take that time. So think of it as, you know, a warming back up into waking life by what did I just experience? What just happened to me? Where was I? And when that becomes a reflexive thought, you're basically making a cognitive habit. Um, you'll be able to do it as a cognitive habit whenever you wake up. So if you wake up in the middle of the night because you have to go to the restroom, you'll be able to recall those dreams um, easily as well. Um, and then the other piece to this is that, you know, the circadian rhythm of the human mind continues throughout the day. So we have ups and downs of consciousness. We don't just have this monophasic, rational waking life, right? So 
uh, we phase out, we go into daydreaming modes, um, and we do it on cycles of about 45, 90 minute cycles. Um, continuously, we go into tiny little fugue states, um, almost like light trance states. Um, and so when you become aware of those states, those are great times to practice dream recall. You say, oh, I'm in a, oh, look at this, I'm in a dreaming state right now, and to sort of sit in it rather than try to stir out of it. Um, and you might find that, that it's easier to recall dreams at certain times of the day. Uh, and the other time, of course, that's easy to recall dreams would be at night as you're shifting down into sleep. I often find just as I settle down into sleep that last night's dream, which I completely had forgotten about, comes back to me um, spontaneously on its own. And it's almost like it was waiting for me to just get right back into that resonance again. So there's so so be mindful of your own rhythms, and they of course are unique to all of us. Um, one thing that that I find helpful in terms of remembering dreams is before I go to sleep, I ask my dreaming self to help me remember a dream. And I find that you know sometimes it listens, and you wake up with a dream. Nice. Yes, absolutely. And we, um, and Tracy had also asked about dream incubation, and it is something we're going to cover today. And uh, Angelo had asked about time in dreams, and um, there's a couple of effects going on with time. Um, one, there's a narrative effect. So some dreams can, in fact, seem to take years and go through a, like, like a story, like a myth. Um, and it can feel like time has passed. Um, because we essentially do story blocking in the dream where there'll be a scene and then a cut and then another scene. Um, and it creates a psychological effect of time passing that is deep. Um, and those kind of dreams happen all the time and they're pretty common. Um, the research into the sort of conscious moment and how that maps onto and is compared with say waking consciousness of time passing and the perception of time has been done with lucid dreaming in the laboratory and so in which people have basically um, been asked in the lab to have a lucid dream and start counting basically one mississippi two mississippi um until uh they're to, to 10 and then to intend to do some eye movements or to wake themselves up and what was found is that it was roughly the same and so the lucid dreams are a little different than um, than a lot of other dreams, normal dreams. They so that that time signature piece might be different, and it's just difficult to. I don't even know how you would do that research in non lucid dreams. So um, so I would say just doesn't even matter. Um, there you know time is a vortex. So uh, I I've had dreams for sure. I once had a dream in which I felt like I was being I was being mentored. And the dream took place like a movie, it was just various scenes taking place over time of, of being mentored, learning some skills, and a month passed in my dream. Uh, and it wasn't, the feeling of time passing was rich in the sense and deep that I felt like I had spent and learned that much, like a month's worth of knowledge had been downloaded. And so, um, and so I can't explain that, but, but it certainly, certainly does happen. So, so this is good to hear. This is good to hear your, um, um, your comments. I'm in the chat. I'm seeing, um, talking about dreams and symbols. Um, can try to do that too. Um, but I thought what would be not neat now is to, is to do a, uh, dream sharing practice and, and I, we're going to, let's see, let me see. Actually, no, we're going to hold off on that. We'll hold, we'll do a dream sharing practice a little later. I would like to move through a little bit more content about sort of the big picture of dreaming and its benefits and and sort of a little bit of the science, but we'll brush past some of this stuff so we can get to your questions as well. So when I talk, the, the big picture of, of, of why is dreaming important, uh, the main thing to remember is, is that 
even the classic psychotherapists like Carl Jung um, would say that it doesn't matter whether or not you recall a dream at all because the work, the healing is being done anyways. So the idea that dreaming is learning, the idea that dreaming is um, self-discovery, dreaming is a conscious experience that we forget, uh, it has its own mystery to it, but the work is getting done. So everything that we do with recalling dreams and working with dreams is basically bonus. It's bonus. Uh, and culture moves that forward. And in culture uh, amplifies these natural effects of dreams and, and yeah, it amplifies it. It, 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 it leverages it. And so even if you don't recall your dreams, even if you don't recall any dreams, rest assured you're having them and dreams are doing what they need to be doing. Um, and, and so that's just one of the ways of saying that there's no wrong way to be a dreamer. Um, there's so many different styles of, of people in terms of their dream recall. Some people will remember a powerful dream twice a year and then they can work those dreams, say, in a private practice with a therapist for the next 10 years and derive exceptional amounts of, of meaning and content and, and life direction and purpose from that. Um, and then there's those, those that are like super, super dreamers who are re remembering three to five dreams a night. And, um, and they're just deluged with, with all this unconscious content. Um, and, and they pick and choose what to work with. So, so uh, rest assured, there is basically a spectrum, in, but all of us can, if we wish, have more recall in general based on that. So one of the things that I talk about is that, is that dreaming can best be seen as an altered state of consciousness that is you know, the same creative mind at work in waking life, but with a different neuropsychological signature. So we are still ourselves, but we are in a different frame of mind. We're in a different way of being. We are not in, the, in a rational waking state. Instead, what's going on is, is that the frontal cortex, the, the part of the brain that involves metacognition, um, um, you know, metaconsciousness, abstraction, that part of the brain is having less activity and the middle brain, the, the limbic brain, uh, which is sort of you know, the emotional center um, of, of our thinking is heightened. It's just going off like fireworks. And so there's a lot of strong emotions that come through dreams. Uh, and so, and, and meanwhile, you have a very deep resonance with the visual parts of the brain are, are lighting up too. And so you've got lots of intense visual imagery that's linking into strong emotionality. And at the same time, the heightening of long-term memory and the depression of short-term memory. And so we're having visual, emotional metaphors creating that are based on our root experiences that come from the first part of life. And these are our is how our personal mythology gets created. That's why you dream about high school, even though you haven't been in high school for 30, 40, 50 years. I still dream about my locker sometimes going in. <laughs> you know, um, this is why you dream about neighbors, about friends that, that you haven't seen in years and years. Um, th there is this sort of long-term um, activation that's happening. And and the, the mythology piece to this, or the neuro mythology, you could say, is that dreams are basically showcasing this paradigm of reality, this visual, emotional, you know, core memory and trauma, right? Those times that we were traumatized in the first half of life and constructing a worldview, a platform of understanding the world, and it's being tested by recent experience. And so dreams are bringing in, as Freud postulated, and basically one of the aspects of his theory that I think is most correct, um, bringing in material that we just experienced, you know, day residue, 
right? Experiences not just from the day before, but impactful experiences from the last two weeks or so. Emotionally impactful experiences, um, bizarre experiences, things that made you go, huh? Those come in and are tested against our default paradigm. And so basically, if you're, you know, the metaphor is, is that this, um, the core mythology sets the stage, but your recent experiences brings the drama. And, and we're trying to figure out how does this new information work with what we know about the world? And where is the dissonance? And, where, and is there conflict? And yes, there's conflict. It's mostly conflict. Because, and that's why the dream is bringing it up. And so we're learning new things. And we're also given an opportunity to rewrite and to, to revisit our core mythology um, and to shift it. And I think that's where the dream work piece comes in is because is, is, is amplifying that work, bringing it, making it conscious. Um, so we, you know, become more aware of the fact that we um, aren't, for instance, being bullied anymore like we were in elementary school. And so we don't have to worry about that um, and that we are safe or, you know, different other kinds of myths that come, that come from, from other times. So, so that's sort of a, uh, yeah, I would say a psychoneurological mythological framework for how I see dreams as being about the past, the present, and the future. So they're, you know, they're possibilities. Um, and that being said, there is a playful aspect of dreaming that can't be discounted. Even, you know, yes, sometimes there's trauma. Yes, there's even PTSD, which is kind of a whole different post-traumatic stress disorder dreams are in a whole different category. But by and large, our dreams are playful. They're just trying things on. Um, the creativity has been increased. Um, aberrant thoughts are um, coming in. Thoughts that would usually get repressed by the waking mind as being irrational, they, they are emerging. And so having a playful spirit about looking at dreams, I think is essential. Not taking it too seriously, really just being able to flirt with the images and to play with it, try something on, try an idea on, um, right? Uh, walk around in it for a little while and then see how it works. So, so in, in, in the last piece, I would say, um, which we'll get more into with some, some of this incubation idea, is, is, that, is that the more you focus on your dreams and, and the more you focus on what you're looking for out of your dream life, the dreaming will, the dreaming will come and meet you halfway. So you'll begin to have more... Or, um, more dreams about possibility or more dreams of relationship dreams if you're working through a, a relationship issue um, or dreams about life purpose and vocation. Um, you know, we, we can basically do a soft incubation of, of these things because it's already working on the deep level. And, and this, this is, comes out of the cognitive psychology of dreams is that we dream about the things that are most important to us. We already do. So all you have to do is hone in on that and, and you can amplify that as well. And so what happens is this nice little give and take, this conversation between the waking um, analytical and focused mind and the unconscious mind that's doing its own thing anyway. And when you begin to have this conversation, it takes you into new, into new realms and, and the work deepens. I'm going to open it up. How'd that resonate? What comes up for you? I, um, I just think the last thing you said, well, the, the idea about playing with your dreams it's, it's just a really great way to think about, um, well, you said trying things on, a great way to think about making changes in our lives. You know, um, I remember times when I would ask for um, assistance before going to sleep so that I would have a dream. 
for the purpose of trying to do something like that, you know, checking out how it might feel or getting an idea that I could then take when I wake up and um, try to play with something, you know? Um, so that's a beautiful thing. And thanks for saying that because I want to think about that more personally for myself. So that's what I want to say. Nice. Great. Yeah. And, and, and from an artistic perspective, this is, this is, you know, dreams can really um, meet you halfway um, if, if art is important to you. Um, and, and then the, you know, and then the, the extra effect is, is if you can incubate a lucid dream, become aware that you're dreaming and you can essentially create um, avenues for, for new artistic ideas. And you can ask for them or you can go to a dream gallery <laughs> and look at the wall and see what shows up. I know some artists who, who literally do that. They go to their dream gallery and they see what to paint next. And then they paint the what's rings, in their dream so gallery. Done it uh, so the so in that terms, you can see that the relationship is highly tuned. It's a lot. Yeah. Okay. Well, like, welcome yeah. back dreamers. Well, so, so <laughs> it is 10 minutes before 12. All right, all back. Right, so we're missing it, two. Uh, everybody's here except for Michael. No, oh, Fern and Michael are in a car together. I know this, yeah. They're here. What a beautiful picture of Fern. She's as beautiful in real life, too. Cool. Well, um, we're, we're going to break really soon, but before we take a take a break, how how was that experience? And, uh, and By the way, Ryan, we have 25 minutes on the clock, by the way, just so you know. Perfect. So, so, uh, so, how was that experience? And what was it like to to share a dream uh, in a sort of a sacred space where you have the time to do so? Or um, what was it like to to listen to the dream? Um, so you can. I'm just curious to hear how that was. Um, I found it very enriching, and um, and it's funny because the dream that I heard had some food in it. And I also felt very nurtured by hearing the dream. I mean, it's sort of like a funny thing, but it was it was a very positive experience. So Suzanne and I were in the breakout room together, and she commented on, you know, we we she she commented on this the food element of the dream, and you know, could it be referring to other people, or and and after she gave me her interpretation my own memory my own experience of this dream that i had had a few weeks ago changed and that element of it became instead of just one sort of odd part of the dream it it turned into the central part of the dream so that was fascinating suzanne thanks nice thanks for that I don't know if I'm, I'm answering the question, but it was interesting. I came in late to the breakout room, and it turned out that Bill and I had very similar um, similar dreams about school. The the main distinction being he he was like he had he he was he had a, a teaching and I was a student. <laughs> uh, there's more to it than that, but anyway, it was just interesting. We had the same sort of locale in the dream. Nice. Nice. Ours were very archetypal, I felt, and it was uh, powerfully emotionally resonant to hear it when somebody put kind of language where I'm experiencing this. I thought, oh my God, when just a powerful way to enter someone's experience and in a way where you say, I, I totally get that. I've been there, I go there, whatever. It was beautiful for me. Nice. Nice. And here, and here's one last question. Um, did you find that listening to someone else's dream, it was easier to see and reflect on the patterns compared to your own dream? Yes. I've seen some maybes, some I don't knows. Well, yeah. And it feels like, uh, Maybe if you knew that person a little bit more, you would understand, okay, I could see you having this dream. This is what is on, on your mind in real life or whatever. I felt that, especially with those two. 
I was in Angelo and Bill's group. They were very similar. Thanks. Thanks, Zachary. And Tracy, did you uh, have something to say? I had, yeah, I had this feeling that if, if the dream I had portrayed told was something fresh, it would be absolutely true that, for me, that um, if I hadn't really looked at it, that the other person's depiction of their dream would feel easier to jump into, um, for me at least, than my own sort of mysterious new fresh dream. Does that make sense? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the, the experiment of, of, of dream sharing is to show a couple of things. One is that how fulfilling it can be to be heard, um, to express something when people have created a space for doing so. So there's, you know, the corollary is, is that there's good times and bad times to share dreams. Um, and so when you want to share dreams and you should share as many dreams as you can, choose those times when the dream can be given, given some space and some respect. Um, and that will prevent eye rolling. Oh, there's another dream, you know, kind of, uh, you hear this sort of um, the banter sometimes, but it's, it's really about creating respect. And, and the second piece is that when we share dreams to each other, the dream can take on interesting new significances. Bill was saying, uh, no, Jim, Jim was saying about the, the food aspect right um so something that was just a tiny piece of the dream can become amplified and in, in new meanings and so the dream becomes all of our dreams when you share a dream with five people there's now six versions of that dream floating around the room and that's something jeremy taylor uh uh did a lot of collective dream work so it's nice to, to they go outside of ourselves. The dream becomes all of our dreams. When you share a dream with five people, there's now six versions of that dream floating around the room. And that's something Jeremy Taylor did uh, uh, a lot of collective dream work. So it's nice to share a dream with these and they, they, they go outside of ourselves. I'm muting Angelo because you're typing too loud. <laughs> so, so, um, so that's great. So, listen, I need to take a bio break. We're gonna take we're gonna take a five minute bio break, and then we're gonna come back, and then we're gonna do some question and answer. We're gonna finish up with dream incubation, and some of the other questions that have come up. And so. Um, Y'all absolutely can just stay on and talk amongst yourself, but I will be back in five. Sound good? What's going on, Pitak? You're a mute. Mute. You're a mute. Yeah, it's it's nice to sort of um, have a seminar on dreams. I you know. yeah, I didn't realize he was going to get that deep into it. You know, it's cool. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> when you going to when you going to do your seminar? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> One of my favorite subjects, to be sure. <laughs> Can we do this every week? <laughs> really fascinating for me, truly. And it's, I think it's hard to find a space that is, at least for me, it's been really hard to find a space that is ideal to do this. Um, my sister has heard a lot of my dreams. She's held a lot of them. It would be nice to be able to have a continuity and during this time, at least for me, I think it would be really powerful. So I'm motivated to start doing more recall now. The thing that interests me is the idea of uh, group dreaming, people are dreaming together. That, 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 um, that really fascinates me. And, uh, what and what do you be, mean by that? Well, it could be, you could set it up any way that you want. Maybe, maybe you have like a group of colleagues or something like that. You made, you made, you made, um, 
a decision you're going to just all dream together and just similar to what you were saying not about interpretation uh it's just you know this is what this is what we dreamed okay. um, and i've seen different um iterations well i've seen one iteration of that um that some some people in the group relations community have done um it's really not uh, what they will do is that um you know after a night they have like a board and um before that people are just asked what did you dream and it's just people just go around and say i dreamed this i dreamed that if they want they could put that on the board or, or not and um it's quite interesting you know uh, i'd like to ask ryan about that we, him and i have talked about that a little bit you can yeah. also have dreams that are sort of like focused on the particular issue and everybody yeah dream about the issue like um Years ago, when the uh, houseboat community in Sausalito was threatened, the whole community got together and asked for dreams about. Is that right? And, wow! And on the basis of those dreams, they were able to save it. So. Really. Yeah. So there's a practicality. Could be a practicality to it as well. I'm not big on practicality. That, that's interesting. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah. It's practical, and it's it's actually beautiful too, and very hopeful. If you think about the power and the empowerment that goes along with that as a community to really heal or come to a solution together um, and distance with distance we can do a lot more with distance yeah. now i remember um i'll just say this really quickly i remember um about six months ago i had an experience to with a beekeeper to do community dreaming communal dreaming about bees ah. That's what I think. That's what started this and started percolating more during this time. So, so Ryan, Ryan, we're talking about uh, group dream, uh, people dreaming together, um, virtually or oh, actually, they can even be. Here. And yeah. Suzanne shared an experience where, um, you know, there was um, something happening in a community, and they'd made a decision to dream together, and that helped save the issue that they were dealing with. Oh, that's amazing. That's I amazing. So. Yeah. And so did Tracy. Like if you if you collectively say, let's dream on this to give the topic, right? Yeah, there and there are some groups doing that. I'm looking up on Facebook right now because I can't remember offhand what this group is called, but I want to Shoot you into them if I can find it. Yeah, you mentioned something when we talked, Ryan. Or some somebody had done research about this, or some, something. I remember. I would love to, to know if there's resources for groups where people explore explore their dreams. If you lead those, Ryan, or if you know. The yeah. So this. So uh, so there is a uh, organization that I'm a part of called the International Association for the Study of Dreams. Um, I'm going to put their website in the chat. They've been around since the mid 1980s. Um, they support dream education and dream research, including dream work. Um, a lot of the dream workers from the contemporary dream sharing movement uh, have came out of the ASD and now they do international conferences. Um, and they did not do their, they usually have a international conference, um, a meeting <laughs> once a year and it was canceled this year. It was supposed to be in Arizona. It was in June. Uh, so they did something, you know, on zoom, um, next year, I think it's supposed to be in, I think in Portland, I am um, Oregon trying to recall. And then, uh, every third year or so it goes to Europe. Um, Often the Netherlands, there's a amazing, um, oh gosh, it's like a castle or something. It's a, uh, it's in a roll duck anyhow. Um, so they go back and forth to a couple of cool locations and amazing experiences. Um, and they also have online groups and they're also on Facebook and I do the social, I'm an administrator of the Facebook page, um, the group there. And so there's lots of cool connections with dreamers to make through the IASD. Uh, for pretty much any topic that you're interested in from the scientific research all the way to mutual shared dreaming shamanism um everything in between sciences to, 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 to shamans so that's my plug for the iasd um 
Is everyone back? Um, looks like everyone's back. Great. Do we have a hard stop at 12.30, Angelo? No. I want to respect everyone's time and expectations. I would prefer if we had a hard stop, but I'm, I'm able to go a little, little, little while longer. Okay. I can't do it in 10 minutes, but I think we could, I think we could probably do it in 15 to 20. Okay. Um, uh, part two of where I wanted to go is a lot, has a lot to do with what you've brought up already in terms of your interests. Um, but I want to do a, a core piece of content first talking about what separates big dreams from little dreams and how to call dreams, how to um, do what I was saying about bringing them in and focusing them so they can, so the dreams can continue the conversation of the creative mind uh, with more focus. And so, you know, one of the interesting things about, I, I guess you could say the anthropology of dreaming is that almost every culture has a distinction between unimportant or little dreams and big dreams. Uh, and little dreams, you know, we can just say in a very um, diffuse sense are the dreams of everyday life that we have most often that don't have strong emotional content. Um, maybe they're a little weird. Maybe they're set in high school. Maybe we're in a classroom. Um, you know, they're, they're sorting through the everyday business of living. Uh, and we forget probably most of these. They don't even make it to, to recall. Um, and of course, that's a, a known in itself. Um, big dreams, they um, are a horse of a different color. They come on their own trajectory in their own time. They, um, they can be called, but you have to wait for them. Um, and big dreams are these dreams that are sort of, I would say, put them in, they're impactful. Um, they also have, they're more resistant to traditional forms of interpretation or dream work. Um, so um, Freud hated big dreams because he couldn't get anywhere with um, doing his analysis. Jung celebrated them for that very reason. Jung was like, these are just simply a different kind of dream. These are visionary experiences. You can't just um, uh, materialize them um, as this equals that. They, they're living entities. Uh, and so some of the things you know, that have come together in terms of the traits of them is that they're extraordinarily vivid. They have strong salience in terms of emotionality. So very emotional. Um, they can be nightmares. You can wake up from a big dream. Um, it could be more like existential dread rather than fear. It could be more like disgust. Uh, but it also can be on the positive side of the spectrum of awe and ecstasy um, and um, of the feeling of being of transmission that, that, um, that Cindy had mentioned, of, of information, of some insight. Um, something you know has come in. Uh, they tend to have themes symbolically that are more natural settings and have like caves, waterfalls, uh, flying over forests, um, you know, earth-centered dreams. Um, so um, they can have an initiation quality to them. Um, we feels like we can be we're being tested. There's um, a right thing to do and a, right, a wrong thing in the moment. It, it can feel like that. Which door do we go in? Do we go down the stairwell where the spiders are? Um, when I didn't do that, I failed that initiation the other night. When I said, nah, I'm not going to go down there, well, that was a tiny little dream initiation that I, that I missed. I don't carry it too heavily because guess what? That spidery stairwell is just waiting for me for next time, you know. That's exciting, right? So, so big dreams come and go, um, and they can come interestingly over a span of decades, right? So you can have a dream, and then 15 years later, hmm. you can have, you know, part two. Um, and so they they really work on a deeper a deeper level. Um, they can come, especially to at times of life transition. So knowing that we're in pandemic dreaming, knowing that this is a time of, of upheaval of anxiety, um, of, of great potential, of great possibility, of transformation. It's the great pause, right? Um, we can expect for big dreams to come so we can clear the path for them. We can make, make way for them. 
And the way to do that is the process of incubation. Uh, and so dream incubation is to call a dream or to ask for a dream to, and to, um, to sweep the path for the dream to come. And, and there's, there's some traditions that go back uh, thousands of years. Um, and, and one of them is the Greek tradition and the, and the Asclepian tradition, uh, Asclepius, the healing god. Uh, in, in, in ancient Greece, you know, the, the cult of Asclepius was um, more popular than, than the Christian cult. Uh, and it lasted for something like 1500 years. But people would go to these sanctuaries um, and they would go to dream. They would call healing dreams. And the goddess Clepius and his consorts or his, his symbols would come and actually do healings on dreamers. And they were coming for chronic pain. They were coming for the kind of ailments that modern medicine still can't fix. Um, it's like, yeah, chronic pain or um, anxiety, psychological disorders, um, um, sexual um, function, erectile disorders, uh, foot pain, back pain, all these sort of things, these chronic issues that, that you know, um, that the wartime medicine uh, that we excel at in the modern world still has trouble with these aspects of healing. And these aspects of healing take time they take, and they take a holistic approach. And so when the Asclepian tradition um, was all about was creating a sanctuary where people would stay for weeks. They would, they would eat clean, natural, simple foods. They would, um, they would pray, they would sleep, they would meditate, they'd walk in the grove, they would immerse themselves in a natural setting away from their life. So they took retreat. This is retreat that I'm talking about. So we can't always do retreat. And right now we're all, ret we're all retreating at home. Mm -hmm. But there's ways to bring in this sort of a Sclepian paradigm into waking life. And it's about just making space for calling a question every night that you're on and doing the practice as you go to sleep. Um, and it's about, you know, and simply it's, the practice is to take an hour or so for your bedtime ritual. Um, to really take an hour to move into sleep. Uh, and, and the way that it breaks down it is 20 minutes for, for finishing up the emails and looking at what has to happen the next day and you know, you're going to read the news, this is it, putting the information away, and the next 20 minutes taking care of your, which is the basic bedtime rituals, uh, preparing for sleep, sleep clothes, cleaning the room, cleaning the space. Um, if you have a sleep partner, you know, dimming the lights uh, throughout the house to, to show that this is a time of moving into quiet, moving into sacred space. And then the last 15 or 20 minutes or so is getting into bed and, and essentially doing some restful thinking and some resting, not trying to sleep, not watching Netflix on these nights, uh, but looking at the dream journal or having um, or reading about dreams uh, or opening up your dream journal to ask a question to make space to what is it that I need for my dream life tonight or this week because sometimes it's not it's not instant um it's it, it can take a period of a week or so um and to do an incubation is to ask a question um the the, the question is um got to be focused but but flexible but open so um uh that way the, the dream has some time some time to respond uh, and, and when we do this, when we make space for this, we're basically giving permission for the dream to meet us. Um, and then the second half of the process is what we talked about earlier today, which is writing down dreams or giving yourself a, t a time to reflect on them as you wake up. And so that's the bookends. You set the intentions, you ask your questions, you close your book, and then you go into sleep mode. And then you wake up and you see what came. And, um, and you're patient, basically. Patient. Uh, and of course, it doesn't mean you can't ever watch Netflix before bed. It's just like there's on nights and off nights for these things. And just notice your own 
attention. Be honest with yourself. Do I have attention for this or not? Um, am I making myself do this? Um, maybe that's not the, not, not the right night. Uh, but if you can do this for three nights in a row, something magical happens. Okay, so when you're setting up a, a parameter of time um, of sacred sleep, sacred rest for three nights, this seems to be, I don't know, that's where the magic is. Um, I've noticed the same thing with camping. You know, if you can spend the night camping for a few nights in a row, Ooh, we, we hit a whole nother dimension of rest and, and recuperation and, and dreaming as well. So that is the practice that I would um, suggest you take home and give a try. And these questions that you ask your dream, I would suggest that if you share them, maybe share them with your partner, but it's not something that you blast all over Facebook. Uh, you keep, keep the power, keep it to yourself. Um, and, and let the work happen and then let it go underground because what might happen is is that a week later a big dream will come with an answer but you're going to write down your dreams that come anyway and see, and see what reflects and then lastly is how do we honor these dreams and so interpretation is one thing but honoring them is kind of another and you know there's a lot of artists in the space and so doing doing art on the dream images that come forward um, of course, speaking about the dreams, moving them into the social space is important. Uh, but also ritual. Consider a ritual element. Is there something, a way that you can honor the dream by taking a walk in nature and setting some stones somewhere or, 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 um, or making that phone call to that person that, um, that you're dreaming about? Um, you don't have to tell them, oh, I just had this weird dream about you, but you can connect with them. You know, there's ways that we can move move the dream energy around and stick with it um, to honor that dream. And even if we don't know what the dream is about, it's basically just keeping the energy going, moving it about. And when we begin doing this, when we honor a dream, when we ritualize, um, when we concretize a dream into action or into art or into the social space, then the dream might even come back again in a, in a third sense, um, part two. So, so that's, that's the, the art of dream incubation in a nutshell and, and dream honoring in a nutshell. Um, I talk about this at greater length in my book, Dream Like a Boss, which is an ebook that you can get on, on my website, dreamstudies.com. Um, but, you know, um, working with these dreams, working with these dreams um, and working with nightmares Nightmares can be uh, harder to do, but essentially it's the same thing. If you think of a nightmare as, as a dream that's really trying to get your attention, um, that it's basically the nightmare has come before, the thing has come before, we haven't paid attention. Well, here, here it is now literally waking you up. It's saying, wake up. And, and that image, that thought, that feeling, that memory, is, is crossing a boundary from the dream world into the waking world. And, we're, and so when we cross a boundary, we cross a threshold like that, we want to pay attention. So nightmares can be worked in a similar sense. Uh, most of them, not PTSD nightmares, take another, take another stance. It's really a different topic. But most, you know, what we call the idiopathic nightmare, um, the repetitive nightmare, can be worked with by, by doing a little reflection on the nightmare during the day, perhaps doing some artwork and even some rescripting of the nightmare. So drawing a, a different outcome. Um, if, if I were to have this dream again, what choice would I make differently? Uh, you know, where were my points of choice in the dream and what could, could I do when this nightmare comes again? And essentially play with it, play with it in that sense. Is it about boundaries? Do I need more space? Do I need more protection? Um, do I need to stand up for myself? Um, do I need to stand up for somebody else? Uh, what's being transgressed here? Uh, and how can, we, how can we heal that? How can we reflect on, 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 on giving ourselves some more power in that way? So in terms of ritualizing nightmares, there's, these are really fun. Um, and I do this with kids. 
I have kids draw nightmare images, and then you can shred them. So you draw the image, and then you just crumple it up, and you throw it away, or you bury it, or you, I don't tell this to kids, but you, or you burn it, <laughs> right? So you can, you can um, let it go up in flames. Um, and so, the, you know, these are just ways of working with the images, not just the words, uh, because, the, you know, working with dreams, if you can stick closer to images and emotions, the work is cleaner, I think. Um, dreams do have a linguistic component, absolutely. The metaphors are sometimes linguistic, uh, but by and large, it's a kinesthetic, it's an emotional, it's a visual language. And so if you can work with those elements of your dreams, I, I feel that you can go further with them quicker. Food came up. Now, I don't know what the food sharing dream was about, but sometimes food, reactions to food can, come, can be two things. It can be a health, it can be a health related factor of um, this is a food to get more of, or this is a food to have less of, depending on how the food was represented in the dream. It could be a way of your, of your body saying, I need something, I need something different. Um, of course, it could be a metaphor for other kinds of nourishment. Um, and, but there's also this piece that, that I'm excited about, which is the ancestral component to, to food. Um, ancestral recovery can happen by following food that shows up in your dreams. Um, what is the body craving? What is the body asking for? Um, it can sometimes be medicinal as opposed to, you know, something like a candy, right? Um, we'll dream about, um, I, you know, I dreamt about sauerkraut for quite some time. And this is a way that I kind of found my way back into my own Germanic traditions. Um, and also it helped my gut health at the same time. So it was, it was a double, it was a double there. Uh, but I, I had to honor that dream. The sauerkraut came to me. <laughs> so, so, um, you know, th this is interesting. So, so food is, is not something that doesn't often come up a lot in dreams. So pay attention to what it does and what does it feel like in the moment? Um, what's your relationship to that piece of food? And, and then, and then do some research, go deeper into that, into that food. What is it? What are the, its mineral components? What, you know, how is it, um, are there herbs in there, right? Um, uh, should it be, is something to be avoided or something that, that the body's asking for is a question, question to hold. Um, I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna pause. Cause I just basically went on a download spree. Um, What's coming up right now, given that we have, say, five or five or 15 minutes, you know, 10 minutes tops, um, where are you right now? And um, what would you uh, like some direction on? What is your website again? That's an easy one. Um, <laughs> I'll put it in the chat. It's dreamstudies.com for the ebooks and dreamstudies.org, the blog. And they're connected. I mean, you can get from one to the other. Thank you. I also sell Talisman for lucid dreaming as an incubation aid. And that has its own website. Share that, share that website too then, please. I just put it in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. Brian, thank you so much. This has been absolutely fascinating and giving me some things to do going forward. I need to call back some uh, grandkids on the West Coast. So I'm gonna sign off right now. But okay. Again, thank Thanks you so much. It was really informative and wonderful. Thank you, Angelo, for uh, organizing it. Bye all. Take care. Uh, hi there, it's Michael. A very quick comment. I appreciated what you said about initiations in dreams because that really brought back a number of experiences I've had um, over the past maybe 30 or 40 years with um, a specific spiritual teacher but then also just general, uh, generally, generally and that's one of the things that's inspired me to pay attention to dreams because there have been a number of times where I've woken up feeling like I was given 
uh, you know, a, a blast of light and initiation and um, insight and um, like a healing tool. Mm, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I think it's a, an aspect of dreaming that is uh, overlooked. And, and like all things, uh, we take it seriously and we play with it lightfully, right? So um, if you miss the opportunity for an initiation, if you feel like it didn't go well, um, you can incubate for that or you can wait for it to come up on its own accord. Again, because failed initiations tend to give us uh, another opportunity. On that topic, I had a shamanic teacher who used to say, stay in your body. He was constantly telling us, stay in your body, uh, including, I think, in, when you're at night. He said, don't go anywhere. I mean, so I'm wondering about the discernment of what initiation to accept. In real life, I choose to be initiated by some people, not others, but more more importantly, also, like, if you see a stairway with spiders, do you always go down it? Or sometimes, you, know, you don't have to go down. I mean, I feel like in my life, I, I'm trying to learn not to go down every uh, spidery stair, staircase that I find. Say, so you can save yourself a lot of trouble sometimes if you don't. <laughs> So that's absolutely absolutely so we are you know dreamers choice with these things there's no shoulds when we're talking about dream work in our own path um clearly i don't always go down the stairwell of spider either um and <laughs> <laughs> but you took it you took it as a failure of a task that you didn't which has mm -hmm. been my approach in life but now i'm thinking i think i failed some tests by going down some of those stairways mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting. Um, the, the dream just always gives new opportunities. You know, there's been times where in lucid dreams, I, I've taken the dark road to see what happens. To, and, and I've found um, some joyful, spiritually, um, yeah, resonant places that were unexpected. Um, I've also found... Um, in such port like a portal for instance in a dream um if you move into lucid spaces and was it cindy were you asking about visual visual experiences dropping out but so sometimes when we're in a half state or a hypnagogic state ah. um dream imagery can drop out um and it can come back if you if you sort of focus um your eyes eyes closed and just invite dream imagery back and what might first come back if you are truly in a hypnagogic state would be abstract geometric imagery yeah. so those little pinprints you know of um of light yeah. kind of like tv static that we used to have yeah. in the analog days and, and when the imagery can self-organize it sometimes can create three-dimensional vortices and so those can be an invitation to move forward into into some new dream spaces um i found when i move into those dream spaces without an expectation that i have a big dream often and sometimes they are initiations that take me back into childhood with an older dream body an older dream self um and sometimes they're more like ecstatic nature dreams um and sometimes they're dreams of light um that question about should I go out of body? Um, I think that that is it's discernment is good, and if you're um, you know working with a teacher, um, that your dream experiences should be you know, resonant with what you're what you're being taught, um, because it can create conflict otherwise. Uh, and, He's not that guy's not my teacher now actually. So my current teacher, who I like much better, has never said that. I'll probably not not follow that. So, you know, I mean, out of, you know, out of body experiences come out of hypnagogia as well. You know, it's a, it's a physical effect, but it also has spiritual implications and they do take us places. They do take us to new places. And if we stick with it, the dream, when we go out of body, what will happen is a new reality will emerge if we don't wake up. 
Um, and so these new spontaneous dreams places can be, can be really inviting. They can be, you know, um, you can learn things from them. So I, try to, I try to be an anthropologist when those happen. I'm like, oh, what's going to happen next? Um, oh, look where I am. That's interesting. And try to just maintain a little bit of um, uh, um, distance from what I'm experiencing. Um, but I participate at the same time. And, and active participation is important in initiation type settings um, because one can be overrun by dream energy. One can be, you, know, you can move back into some trauma spaces um, by, you know, if you surrender at the wrong time, it, it can be hurtful. And, and we know it because we'll wake up and we'll feel it. We'll feel that we've hurt ourselves in some way and that we've somehow, we've been hit, you know, there's been a blow. So, um, so you know, it's always the best about discernment in, in, in the moment, what to do next. Um, creating meditative spaces in the dream um, can be really uh, interesting. Um, it's easier to do from these void-like spaces than when you're like in a dream body in a dream, because then what tends to happen is everything becomes a distraction. Uh, <laughs> and then you have to kind of keep making decisions about am I paying attention to this or am I trying to imagine that this is imaginal material that I should ignore and anyway it can get very convoluted so um, I tend to, tend to tend to meditative spaces when I'm mostly in those abstract realms as opposed to really dream bodied modes if that makes thank sense you. I have to go so I'm going to sign up but thank you so much this was yeah. Yeah, thank you, Cindy. And, and we'll close here because, because I want to be mindful of your time. And, and I just, um, you know, let's let the conversation continue. I'm on Facebook as well. Um, uh, and find me at the ASD, as I've said. Um, so, you know, I hope to see you, see you online. Yeah, um, Ryan, thank you so much. This, is, this has just been so rich. Um, I'm going to join the organization, not the organization, but at least the Facebook group. And, uh, um, yeah, well, this has just been wonderful. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing with us um, your knowledge. And uh, wow, so let's just be a beginning as opposed to an end. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you, brother. Goodbye.